Welcome to PFT Tutor with Jeffrey Haynes. Please click the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. It's greatly appreciated. In this video, we're going to discuss the selection of FEV1 and answer the question, should you always report the largest FEV1 during spirometry testing? This is a flow volume loop from a patient I tested, and it's not a bad looking loop. There are no obvious errors. The computer software assessed the acceptability according to the ATS ERS standards and did not identify any errors. The FVC and FEV1 from this maneuver were normal, however the FEV1 to FVC ratio is below both the gold threshold of 0.7 and the statistical lower limit of normal with a z-score more negative than minus 1.64. Here's a graphic representation of the results. As you can see, the FVC and FEV1 are both in the green zone, but the FEV1 to FVC ratio is below the statistical lower limit of normal. However, the one thing I don't like about this effort is the rounded peak flow, as shown here. With maximal effort, you will typically see a spiked peak flow. So prior to the next spirometry maneuver, I stress to the patient that the initial blast needs to be a little bit more explosive. Don't blow the air out, blast the air out. The first effort is shown in the shaded area. As you can see, a subsequent maneuver performed with a more uh, explosive blast has a higher and a spiked peak flow and that's what maximum effort looks like. The difference between the first and subsequent effort are shown here. With a higher peak flow, both the FVC and FEV1 are lower. So in the left panel, you can see that with the lower peak flow, the FVC was 5.73. With the higher peak flow, it was 5.63. With the lower peak flow, the FEV1 was 3.90 liters, but with the higher peak flow is 3.63 liters and the degree of airflow obstruction got worse, declining from 68% to 64%, and the z-score becoming more negative from minus 1.98 to minus 2.49. The FEV1 was affected more with a reduction of 270 mLs, where the FVC declined 100 mLs. So why is this happening? Well, primarily from the effects of forced exhalation on the compression of thoracic gas and the closure of floppy and flimsy airways. This concept is not new. This study was from the Mayo Clinic, published back in 1987, showing that the FEV1 from the maneuver with the highest peak flow, shown here in the right column, was consistently lower than the highest FEV1 that came from a different effort with a lower peak flow. The effect of peak flow on FEV1 is especially evident in patients with the airway collapse pattern shown here, where shortly after the peak flow is achieved, there's a rapid decline in flow uh, because these airways are not supported by parenchyma and radial traction. I call this pattern the toilet bowl because it does re resemble a toilet bowl and unfortunately it accurately describes the state of their pulmonary function kind of in the toilet. So instead of reporting the largest FEV1, I excluded it because it's not the true FEV1. As you can see, all of the efforts with the higher peak flows had a lower and reproducible FEV1. Bronchodilator was administered and there was a significant bronchodilator response with the FEV1 increasing 15% from 3.66 to 4.24. Remember, this isn't percent change, this is bronchodilator response, so it's post minus pre divided by predicted and a greater than 10% increase is considered significant. The pre-bronchodilator flow volume loop is depicted in the shaded area, and it's easy to appreciate the increase in flows across the entirety of the forced vital capacity. However, if I had reported the largest FEV1, the bronchodilator response goes away, with the bronchodilator response of only 9%. Remember, more than 10% is considered significant. An overestimated FEV1 may also impact the interpretation of a bronchoprovocation test like methicoline, mannitol and exercise challenges. For example, if I use the largest FEV1 with the submaximal effort and peak flow and the max response to methicoline was an FEV1 of 3.10, the percent decline would be 20% and would indicate airway hyperresponsiveness if the PD20 was 400 micrograms or less. However, if we use the true FEV1 with the higher peak flow, that same max decline down to 3.10 liters is only a 15% decline, and that would not be considered evidence of airway hyperresponsiveness. So obviously it's very important that we report the true FEV1. 
Key points, the FEV1 and FEC can be affected by submaximal peak flow. Using the largest FEV1 from a spirometry maneuver with submaximal effort may hide a true bronchodilator response or create an overestimated response to a bronchial challenge test. Be sure to coach your patients to blast the air out, not just blow it out. In most cases, you should be able to obtain a spiked peak flow on flow volume uh, curves. Keep in mind that that may not always be possible with in patients with neuromuscular disease. And the key point here is the largest FEV1 is not always the true FEV1. Thank you for watching PFT Tutor with Jeffrey Haynes. Please click the like, subscribe, and notification buttons, and we'll see you next time.